Good morning, church. I'm so thankful that we could get together on this glorious Easter morning, celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. On that first resurrection day, there were several post-resurrection appearances that took place. Early that morning, you have the women out of their love and their devotion to Jesus who are going to the tomb. Not to find a resurrected Lord, but to show their love to him and anoint his body for burial. Along the way, their concern is who will roll the stone away for us. And when they arrive, they have an encounter with the angels. All of the women except Mary Magdalene return. Mary stays at the tomb, weeping. In fact, she's confronted by the risen Lord, but she's not looking for Jesus, and so she thinks he may be the gardener, and she asks, where have you laid him? And then when Jesus spoke her name, Mary, she knew exactly who he was. And so Mary was the very first one to see our risen Lord. After that, Jesus appeared to the women who had left the tomb and on, were on their way back, and they encounter our risen Lord. But it's the next encounter that I want to invite us to focus on today. It took place near midday. And it's recorded for us in Luke chapter 24, beginning in the 13th verse. So I hope you have your Bibles and you will read along with me this morning. As we read, let us remember that this is the Word of God. It was given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so Luke, being inspired by the Spirit, records this event for us. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and did not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they reply. Now I have to admit, I love this. They're now telling Jesus about his crucifixion. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priest and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have written. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, 
he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village of to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true. The Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Oh Lord, we come before you today asking that your Holy Spirit will take this word and speak to our hearts. Well, we pray that you would illuminate our minds. We ask that your spirit will guide and direct us into truth and that you will open this word up to us. I pray right now for each one who is watching, Lord, just asking that your Holy Spirit will work in a mighty way, preparing each heart for what you would have us to hear. And it's in the precious name of our Lord Jesus that we pray. Amen. When I read that story, I love that powerful conclusion. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? As we reflect upon this passage, for me, I think there are two burning questions. First is, why did their hearts burn within them? And the way they describe it, the second question I would have is, is this something that we can experience? Can our hearts burn within us? And the answer, I think, is obvious that it all begins with Jesus. So what did Jesus do on the road? Well, he talked. But I think we need to understand that this was not just any man who was talking with them. This is the one who has risen from the dead. This is the one who speaks with all authority. In fact, that was one of the hallmarks of Jesus' ministry. Right from the very beginning, we read the people saying they were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. And then after his resurrection, just prior to Jesus' ascension, he highlights that truth once again to his disciples in Matthew 28 when he says, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. And so this is not just any man. This is the Son of God. This is God incarnate. This is God in the flesh. And this is our resurrected Lord. So does that mean we cannot experience what these two men on the road to Emmaus experienced? 
Is the Emmaus experience something that is exclusive to these two men? Well, Jesus, the one with all authority, answers that question. In fact, he answered that question on Thursday evening when he was in the upper room with his disciples. Jesus had a lot to say to his disciples that evening. And in John, he records this. Jesus said, The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. See, that means that we have the Holy Spirit to instruct us, to teach us, just as Jesus taught these two disciples. In fact, Jesus went on and he said, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. And so what I think we really have here on the road to Emmaus is a prelude. What Jesus is doing for these disciples is what the Spirit of God will do for us. It's what the Holy Spirit will do in our lives. And so the answer is yes. We can experience what these two disciples on the road to Emmaus experienced. Our hearts can burn within us. And so the next question would be, what did Jesus talk about? And they said, he opened the scriptures. In verse 27, it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scripture concerning himself. Jesus taught them what the Old Testament had to say about him. Now, I know there's been some who have said that as the church today in the 21st century, we need to unhitch from the Old Testament. Well, Jesus didn't unhitch from the Old Testament. The first thing that he teaches right after his resurrection is he takes the Old Testament and we discover that the Old Testament is about Jesus. Now, why would I want to unhitch from that? There is something here. Their hearts burned within them with what Jesus was teaching from the Old Testament. And so what did he teach them? Well, there's a vast subject there. But I'm convinced that one of the things that Jesus instructed his disciples in that day was something that was so current so relevant that they couldn't miss the truth. After all, that's usually how Jesus taught. He would take something that would be going on in their lives or in around them that's taking place, and he would use that as a great opportunity for taking them deeper into their spiritual journey and having those deep spiritual insights. And so what's going on in their lives? Well, right now they are in the midst of celebrating three of the feasts of the Lord. And it all begins with Passover. Thursday evening when Jesus went to the upper room, it was so that he could have the Passover with those disciples. In fact, he says, it is with an eager desire that I want to have this Passover with you. And so they have just celebrated the Passover. And so it's something that's just fresh into their minds. And it states it this way in the book of Leviticus. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. And when you look at Passover, what you discover is that this is really all about Jesus. The picture of the lamb that is sacrificed is a picture of Jesus. It's no accident and it's no coincidence that Jesus was crucified on Passover. This was God's plan of redemption. He had given them a picture that they would celebrate year after year so that when this would take place, they would really understand what redemption was all about. The apostle Paul understood this. That's why he would write to the church at Corinth. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And so let's think about the Passover. 
And when you go back to the very first Passover, it all takes place in Egypt. And the people of Israel are in bondage. They're slaves there. And Egypt is a picture not just of them, but of all of us. Because we are the ones who are in bondage, and we are in bondage to sin. We even become slaves to sin, just as they were slaves, and they were powerless to do anything about it. And we're powerless to do anything about it. We may try to behave, but we simply can't do the things that we need to do. And that Passover lamb was the only way that they could be redeemed. The instructions were given to them. You have these series of plagues that take place. And God told them that it would be with a mighty outstretched arm that he would deliver them. And so you come to the 10th plague. And they were commanded to take a one-year-old male lamb that was without spot or blemish. And that lamb was to be sacrificed. And the blood of the lamb was to be placed over the door and then on the side post of that door. And that evening when the angel came through, if there was no blood on the door, the firstborn of each household would die. But if the angel saw the blood, the angel would pass over. And so what we really begin discovering right away, this lamb is a picture of Jesus and the blood has to be shed. But what's even more important is the blood had to be applied. It wasn't enough just for the lamb to be sacrificed in that. And that's why when Jesus first began his ministry, before he even calls his disciples, he's walking along the Jordan and John the Baptist sees him and he identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so God's plan of redemption begins with the shedding of blood. And unless you know Jesus as the Lamb, you'll never fully understand the Passover. Unless you know Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, you'll never experience God's deliverance from that bondage of sin. And so God's Passover is an invitation to us to be his guest at the feast of redemption. Now, what's going on with them is they're actually in the midst of three feasts. And so immediately following Passover is the feast of unleavened bread. As you read about this in the book of Leviticus, it says on the 15th day of the month. Now remember, Passover was at twilight on the 14th day of the month. And so he says on the 15th day of that month, the Lord's feast of unleavened bread begins. For seven days you must eat bread made without yeast. And so beginning the day after Passover, they were to celebrate for one week the feast of unleavened bread. Now, here's what you discover taking place in that. Not only was the blood of the lamb shed, the blood of the lamb was applied, and then they feasted on the lamb. Moses gives the instructions to the people in the book of Exodus in chapter 12, and here's what he says to them. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you must take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of their houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. You see, what we began discovering is that Jesus is not only the lamb who dies for us, but Jesus is also the one who sustains us and nourishes us. Jesus is the one who actually builds us up in our own spiritual lives and strengthens us. And so what do the people do after the lamb has been slain? They gather around that lamb. That's basically what we're doing today. 
We may not be together physically, but what brings us together right here on Facebook is that we're gathering around the Lamb. Because it's in that Lamb that makes us the family together. And that's where we fellowship with one another. It's where we share a life together. And the next thing that we discover is they were to remove all the yeast from their homes. Now, why would they be doing that? Well, in the Old Testament, yeast or leaven is a picture of something that is disruptive or corruptive. In other words, yeast becomes a picture of sin. And this is a beautiful picture for us because once the blood has been applied, then you remove the evil and it's in that order. I think this addresses a misconception that a lot of people seem to have. I've had several people through the years that have mentioned something like this to me. You know, I'm going to get my life straightened out and then I'm going to come to the church. Well, first of all, this isn't about church, so that's a big misconception. But the other part of that is you can't get your life straightened out. You can't get your life straightened out and then come to Jesus. That wasn't God's plan, and that plan won't work. You come to Jesus, you experience his cleansing through his blood, and then he begins straightening your life out. The leaven or the evil or the sin is removed from our lives after we come to know Jesus Christ. See, that was God's plan. You apply the blood, and then God will straighten our life out. Now, right in the midst of this feast of unleavened bread, there is a third feast, and it is the feast of first fruits. Now, I want us to see if we can get the picture here, because it says in the scriptures, on the day following the Sabbath, after Passover, they celebrated the feast of first fruits. Now, did you get that? Let's look at it this way. We have these three feasts, and so you have Passover that takes place, and on that week, it was on that Thursday evening at twilight that the Passover began. And so then he says, on the day after the Sabbath, after Passover. So you have Passover, and then you have the Sabbath. That's Saturday. It's the silent Saturday. You don't read about anything going on on that Saturday. Jesus is in the tomb. The disciples have ran and hid. You read nothing in the Bible about that Saturday. And then you come to Sunday morning, the first day of the week. And now this is when Jesus was resurrected. That's why we always worship on Sunday. We don't worship on the Sabbath. Sunday's the first day of the week. It's the day of the resurrection. We don't celebrate the resurrection just on Easter. We celebrate the resurrection every Sunday. And in fact, we celebrate it every day, but we come together on Sunday because it's the day of the resurrection. And so the feast of first fruits was a picture of the resurrection of Jesus. The apostle Paul got that. This is what he says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And so for the feast, what the people would do is they would go out and they would get a sheaf of new grain and they would bring that to the priest and the priest would wave it before the Lord. And since this is a new grain, it's anticipating the harvest that is going to come in the fall. And so it's a way of dedicating the entire crop to the Lord. When the harvest comes in, it is all God's. You see the beautiful picture that God has given us here? Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. And one day there's going to be a harvest. And we're a part of that crop if we know Jesus. Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits of all of those who will be resurrected. It's a celebration and remembrance of the fact that we will be raised with him. Now, I'm sure Jesus taught them many things. And he probably didn't have to spend very much time here with this because they know what these feasts represent. And so when Jesus is talking with them, he may have simply had to say, okay, we've just done Passover. That lamb, you've already seen. I'm the one that was sacrificed. You saw me on the cross. 
You saw my blood poured out. And it was all for redemption. And then they're there. Oh my goodness. Wow. And then he tells them about the feast of unleavened bread. And now that the blood has been applied to your life because of me, your sin has been removed. And now we're going to straighten all this out. And they're going, whoa, why didn't I see that? And then he says, and this is the day of first fruits. And guess what? I'm the first fruits of the dead. And then it's like, wow. I mean, this is really something. And he goes through the scriptures. And as he does this, their hearts burn within them. And so that's the next question. Why did their hearts burn within them? I mean, not everyone that Jesus spoke to experienced this. Not everyone who had the scriptures open to them experienced this. So why is that? What is missing and what is it that's needed? Well, I think as you look into this scripture, the first thing that, is that we discover is that it requires the right teacher. Jesus was the one who was teaching them, but he's also told us that he will give us the Holy Spirit to teach us. And I think this is where we oftentimes may miss out in our own lives. How many times before we actually start reading into the scriptures do we actually pause and say, Lord, I'm inviting the Holy Spirit right now just to open this word up and open my heart up. Lord, I want you just to pour into me from this word right now. And I'm inviting the Holy Spirit to be my teacher. You see, we have to invite the Holy Spirit to do that. How many times before we even go to church or before we watch a service online have we actually prayed that prayer? Lord, I really invite the Holy Spirit right now to be my teacher in all of this. It's not Glenn being the teacher, but it's the Holy Spirit who's going to teach us and instruct us in this. And so it has to be the right teacher. And it has to be the right subject. Jesus taught them from the scriptures. I mean, what the Holy Spirit's going to do when he teaches us is he takes from the very word of God. And so it has to be the word of God. But we're also involved in this scene. I have no doubt that these men were hungry for the truth. They're searching for answers. You see, if our hearts are going to burn within us, then we have to have this deep hunger. We have to be searching. We have to be open to the word of God. And then we discover that Jesus spent the greatest part of that resurrection day with these two previously unknown disciples. Nothing else is mentioned between morning and evening. You see, this was a walking seminar from Jerusalem to Emmaus, about seven miles. There's no clocks. There's no rush. They're just simply walking with the master, listening to his voice. Now, I don't know exactly how this happened, but this was their main mode of uh, transportation. These people are used to walking. It doesn't take all day long to walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Now, I know for some of us, seven miles sounds like a long ways to walk in a day. But for them, that's not a long journey. And I think what's going on is they're walking along with Jesus is just what we saw at the beginning of this passage. When Jesus says, what things? And then they stopped. And I can just see this. Jesus is teaching them along the way. And then he says something and they can't even think about walking anymore. They just stop. And they stand there and they're listening to everything that Jesus says. And then they begin continuing their walk with this seminar. And then Jesus will say something else. And then they just have to stop and listen. You see, there's no rush. It's just simply spending that time with Jesus and letting him instruct them. So what is it that makes our hearts burn within us? And it's when the truth of God's word suddenly becomes so clear, so relevant, so real, so intimate, and so personal that we're overwhelmed, we're overjoyed, and we're consumed by it. It's when you have this desire for more. You want more of Jesus. You want more of his word. You want to be more devoted to him. You want to be more obedient to him. You just want more and more and more. You know, I think during this time that 
We're actually not gathering in our churches today. This may be a good time. I think this may be something that God is using in our lives just so that we do slow down like these men on the road to Emmaus. We can't be in that same kind of rush. We're not waiting to get out of church so we can go to a restaurant today. We can't be wondering, when's the preacher going to get through? You know, we got the kids coming over here. We got our egg hunt to do. All of that we've been putting on hold. And it's giving us this tremendous opportunity just to really focus in on what Easter is all about. And so Easter's not about that new dress that we're wearing. Easter's not about everybody getting together. Easter is here. And the things that we used to think were so important, they're gone, and yet Easter is still here. And I think it's where God is giving us this opportunity to slow down and to focus on him, where we can have more of Jesus. I hope and I pray that you'll want your hearts to burn within you and that you're going to be asking the Holy Spirit to be your teacher and you're going to get into the word of God. You know, I actually think that this may be something that God is doing to wake his church up. So that we do come to life once again and that we experience this renewing of his spirit in our lives. And then we experience that renewing of his power in our hearts and our lives. And when our hearts are burning within us, it cannot be contained. Did you catch what happened in this passage? As soon as they go into the house, Jesus takes the bread and he breaks it and he hands it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized it was Jesus. And then at that moment, Jesus vanishes from their sight. And they could not contain themselves. Listen to what happened. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It's true. The Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened to them. Do you get the picture on this? They walked seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they're now no much, not, not much sooner than when they get there. They're back on the road seven miles to Jerusalem, and I've got a feeling they really booked it. They've got something to say. They are excited. They're on fire for Jesus. They can't contain what's in them. They've got to tell somebody what they've experienced. Do you see how that works in our lives when we have the Holy Spirit who makes our hearts burn within us because of the Word of God? We have to go tell somebody. That's what Jesus intended for the church to be. That's what Easter is about, telling others about this wonderful life that we have in Jesus Christ, about the forgiveness of sin and how he's the one that straightens our life out in that and how we are sustained and nourished by him and that we feast upon Jesus and that the Holy Spirit comes and he will teach us if we invite him to do that and we get our hearts burning within us. You see, if you want this Easter thing to be real, then you've got to be opening yourselves up and spending time with the master and listening to him. If you want more than just attending church on Easter Sunday and thinking that you've celebrated the resurrection, there is so much more that God has for us. And so we can thank God that he's given us an opportunity to slow down and give us the opportunity to see a renewing that will take place within his very church so that we can be the church that he's intended for us to be. Pray with me. Oh Lord, I surrender all. Lord, I pray that our hearts will burn within us, that your Holy Spirit will come and teach us from your word and that we'll be open and hungry and desiring what it is that you have for us, Lord, and that we won't be in a hurry, but that we want to spend more and more time with you and that we just can't get enough of you, Jesus. And it's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. Let's be the church that Jesus intended for us to be. Amen.